As the Money Burns is an original podcast by Nikki Woodard. Based on historical research, this is a deep exploration into what happened to a set of actual heirs and heiresses to some of America's most famous fortunes when the Great Depression hits. Each episode has three primary sections. Section 1 is a narrative story. Section 2 goes deeper into the historical facts. Section 3 focuses on contemporary, emotional, and personal connections. Story Recap While others hide their losses, Doris Duke is having a very successful and enviable debutante season. That is, until an injury sidelines her at her own debutante ball. But under the stars, a new romance blossoms. Now back to As the Money Burns, the Belle à Paris. While plans are underway for another big and fantastic ball, one heiress is more focused on affairs of the heart and reuniting forbidden lovers. All the fun activity isn't merely local. Next up, the beaches in France. Section 1, Story In bright and sunny Paris, France, another set of elites gather for the end of summer fun. Here, a select group of royalty mingle about with the wealthy Americans, a hotbed of more youthful passions and endless privilege. Sitting at a vanity, teen heiress and chubby budding fashionista Barbara Hutton debates over today's outfit. In the mirror, she can see the lithe and petite beauty, one of her best friends, Dona Ana Rosa Silvia Rodriguez de Rivas y Diaz de Arrazo, daughter to the Spanish nobleman Count Castilla de Guzman and a Colombian elite mother and sister to the future Marquis, otherwise known as Silvia. The Silvia. The Spanish Juliet to the handsomely rugged Romeo Russian prince Alexis de Bonny. The lovers have been separated by Silvia's father, unhappy to see his daughter cavorting with the penniless prince. Silvia is what our young heiresses are not. The daughter of minor royalty with the most desirable connections and confident in both her physical beauty and charm. She does not worry too much about her future prospects. In fact, she is a notable belle à Paris, and as such will have her choice of suitors, or so her family hopes. Headstrong in her choices, yet savvy enough to accept her circumstances. Unfortunately, this beauty's family were two casualties of the crash in the subsequent Great Depression. Their profitable royal connections limited as close family friends of the soon-to-be throneless King Alfonso XIII of Spain. Silvia's family's poor financial means mandate she marries well. She understands the game and complies. Byreets is a great hunting ground to meet the appropriate prospective husband, while all the cards seemingly remain in her favor. Keeping the routine of annual late summers, the two friends have grown closer over the years. Silvia introduces Barbara into her circle and makes her feel welcome. The shy and timid Barbara wishes one day to transform like a butterfly into someone more like the free, sophisticated, and glamorous Sylvia. A devoted friend, Barbara serves as the ongoing secret liaison to Sylvia and Prince Alexis, delivering love letters between the forbidden lovers. It is the excitement of romance, even one that is vicarious, that keeps Barbara hooked, if not more, than the lovers. Both Sylvia and the prince are sophisticated and practical enough to resign their circumstances of needing others' funds to provide the lifestyle they desire and are accustomed. In contrast, Barbara needs to know love wins above all else. On the bed, the nubile Sylvia giggles and coos, reading another love letter. She rolls over in a dramatic fashion and sighs aloud, remembering their last tryst. She pronounces, Louise, that dull plain girl cannot handle Alexis. He is passionate and sensitive. She will crush his spirits with her boringness. I know, he loves you more, Barbara chimes in. You will be together again. He will always come back to me. It will be all the sweeter when we reunite. Forbidden fruit is the sweetest of all. Sylvia glances back at the letter, her eyes full of lustful energy that needs channeling. Of course she will be with her secret lover again and again. Marriage to others need not stop them. She's very European in a pragmatic, yet sensual way. He needs a fortune, and so do I to survive. Fashion is intense, but poverty will not serve our love well. Barbara scowls at the mention of money. It soils everything. Sylvia looks at her friend with some compassion. 
surely her privileged friend may not be as physically desirable, but a sizable bank account improves one's status considerably. It takes a lot to fund these lavish lifestyles, and who would ever want to give that up? Besides, the family pressure is surmounting, and Sylvia needs to land an appropriate marriage fast. Arrangements will soon be made. Sylvia sighs with the fear of whom it might bring. Sylvia moves over to the vanity and starts adjusting Barbara's hair. Sylvia notices a stunning necklace in the jewelry box and picks it up. Barbara might never have to worry about money. She can be more impractical, if she so likes. Funny how friends envy each other, isn't it? Barbara, you can have anyone you want. You can be one of those American dollar princesses. Barbara cringes. Sylvia soothes. Don't worry, there are plenty to choose from, and we will find the right one for you. Barbara lowers her eyes. She so doesn't believe in love for herself. She did have some sweet suitors from Yale. They would speak of poetry or literature. But alas, their lesser circumstances eventually drove them away. Sylvia sashays around the room, spots the book stuffed amongst Barbara's things. Odes to Love and Fantasy. Sylvia smiles to herself as she relishes her own dramatic love story. American boys. <sniffs> Sylvia tisk tisk. They may be cute and fun, but they will leave you for the office. Take Sam Van Allen. Von went out, but such a serious one with his studies. His brother Henri, now he's more European than American. But their sister Louise? Dull, dull, dull. What? I know them well from Alexis. Sylvia's hands glide over the luxurious garments that would look good on almost anyone, but sadly are not suited for Barbara's physique. Too bad they are not closer in size. Her friend needs a little molding, that is all. A bit more awareness of what will and what won't work for her body. Instill the confidence and the rest will take care of itself. Sylvia throws on the stunning lavish necklace and grabs her friend. You need a sophisticated man of means and leisure, and we are in the best area to meet plenty of those. Sylvia takes Barbara to various cafes and clubs where they meet Sylvia's exclusive set of other carefree royals. Teetotaler Barbara sips her tea or lemonade while the others drink champagne, as prohibition has no reach across the pond or on the continent. But the Jazz Age most certainly has. Being extra flirtatious, Sylvia laughs and dances with the other young, somewhat eligible men. They are all enchanted by her more carefree ways. They don't quite understand her more hesitant American friend. Sylvia's brother Philippe, the future family marquise, offers to dance with the shy Barbara. Barbara feels exceedingly self-conscious, not able to fully dance with abandon like the more colorful Sylvia. In the distance, she sees Sylvia arguing with someone dark and mysterious. There is an intense energy between them. As Barbara and Philippe twirl around, Barbara eventually catches enough to realize the stranger is none other than Prince Alexis. The reignited chemistry is too much to deny. The forbidden lovers slip out into the night. Satisfied, Barbara brightens up. Another secret rendezvous successful. The fiery lovers sneak back into Barbara's for their tryst, only to be busted by a detective and Sylvia's father before they reach the door. A lot of passionate screaming and shouting occurs. Her father pulls her away as Sylvia is reduced to tears. When Barbara returns with her escort, Sylvia's brother Philippe, they find a torn and disheveled Prince Alexis outside, broken under the streetlights. A mixture of anger and self-pity. Philippe graciously guides Barbara to the door and waves goodnight to Barbara's governess and surrogate mother Tiki. Philippe then aids Prince Alexis to his feet and they head off back into the night to drown their sorrows. Section 2. History and Historiography The entanglements of love and history are a messy endeavor. In retelling these tales, it is a constant unraveling of fact and fictions. Lies, deceptions, half-truths, mistruths, cover-ups, scandals, hidden desires. Later memories can be faulty, especially if there's not the appropriate documentation and other substantial proof. 
in so much as based on perception of what is happening or did happen. Nevertheless, the facts, the emotional facts, upon which this story revolves are of primary importance as they lead to the decisions later in life. Throughout the sources, plenty of the same anecdotes repeat, but never in a clear, concise, sequential timeline. However, there is a general sense of the time of life when things occurred. Thus, it is a balance of past and present and somewhat future in trying to bring it all together into some coherent and more psychologically relevant explanation. What does it matter, the dynamics of teen love and romance? Is it important or is it trivial? Or does it actually have a far more reaching effect on a person that requires a thorough analysis? Well, if you want to understand a person, it might be far more relevant than you think. Saying Barbara Hutton had a complicated love life is an understatement. And when one examines her adolescence and young adulthood, the seeds of future heartbreak are clearly being planted. Amongst the several biographies and articles written about her, there's contradictory information about when she became involved with Sylvia and Prince Alexis. The overarching and unifying theme is she was involved in their forbidden love affair, even serving as their courier of love letters. One biography indicates she met Prince Alexis as early as 1925, and others she met Sylvia as late as 1931. It couldn't possibly be 1931. I won't explain right now, as that will come as the timeline plays out in our history. Events are piling up long before then. That makes 1931 far too late to be effectively true. And as with several issues I have in dealing with biographies on Barbara Hutton and Doris Duke, there is a often a mix-up in dates. They get ambience and dynamics generally right, but the hardcore facts are another matter. And that is from the very beginning in the sources. Famed party entertainer and celebrity journalist Elsa Maxwell did a four-part expose series in Cosmopolitan from late 1938 to early 1939. Elsa gets the earlier dynamics wrong, despite having a front row seat to what will occur over the next couple of years. Alas, the proper digging into news articles gives some illumination that the lovers were hot and heavy in Beirut in 1930, reinforcing the timeline I suspected all along. Overall, before the 1929 crash, Barbara Hutton was involved in New Prince Alexis and Sylvia. Sylvia is an enigmatic force in this story and Barbara's life, reference, but with only minor details. Discovering news articles on Sylvia is more complicated by the various misspellings. Remember, she has an extremely long and complicated name, and inconsistent references makes it hard to locate and connect them back to her. Sylvia's whole story is harder to fully piece together, and I can't reveal what is better known without revealing too much storylines and plots far too soon. Sylvia will be Barbara's longest-lasting and closest relationship, as close as a sister. A deep friendship spanning decades, husbands, children, and all the other stuff that life brings. This dynamic is also essential to Barbara Hutton's view on life and love. It will have a profound impact on all that will play out over the next few years. Another thing is well clear, that Barbara always dreamed of being a princess, even so much that when she received a male pony as a birthday present, she insisted on calling him princess. Her royal dreams could become a reality. Money can buy almost anything. Already there's a long tradition of impoverished royals and nobility marrying lesser, socially classed, wealthier spouses. The title hunter marries royal fortune hunter. Surprisingly, it seems easier to locate a title than an ample fortune, especially during this era in post-war Europe. World War I led to the end of many of the remaining ruling royal families, lots of whom congregated in France searching for another wealthier royal and fortune to refinance their lifestyles. This has been happening for almost all of history. One can quickly point out the wealthy Italian merchants, the de' Medici's, marrying one of their females, Catherine de' Medici, to the future King Henry II of France in 1533, thus resulting in her not merely becoming a princess, but a long-reigning queen of France and regent for her younger princely sons. The Gilded Age saw the rise of the American dollar princesses marrying into European royalty, much to the disapproval of the American and European public. The trend even led to the noblemen placing ads listing their estates and titles. The quarterly periodical titled American Magazine was one that featured such ads for American daughters and their mothers to peruse and inquire. These marriages rarely led to happiness and several ended in scandalous divorces. 
the ruthless railroad tycoon and robber baron Jay Gould's youngest daughter, Anna, being one who married Count Paul Ernest Boniface de Castellan, known as Boni, who needed to cover his gambling debts and fund his expensive art collections. The marriage lasted a little over a decade, and their divorce was scandalous and a media circus. About his marriage to Anna Gould, Count Boni de Castellan simply explained, It was very simple. Our eyes met, our hands met, our lips met, and our attorneys met. Giving Elsa Maxwell a tour of his ballet rose, the pink marble replica modeled off the Trinon at Versailles, Boni shruggingly referred to the bedroom he shared with Anna as La Chapelle Expiatoire, meaning the Chapel of Atonement. Anna would turn around and then marry another noble and Boni's cousin, the Marquis of Talleyrand Paragold and Duke of Sagan. I know those details sound irrelevant, except in some ways, they are not. They really are not. They are parallels in story and not too distant in relation for those involved in a story within a story within a bigger story. All the random names I have just given you are far more complicated and involved in the social and marital entanglements than I can easily explain, especially auditorily. And beyond knowing the family trees and intertwining vines, I have to try and flesh out information that makes them distinguishable. But what that really means is that there is a lot of overlap and somewhat incestuous like nature to the marriage amongst royals, nobles, and the wealthy. There is also a very prominent and heavy trend to cross-alliance marriages, and anyone who barely explores them would know they come with lots and lots of complications. That's the best forewarning I can give at this moment for where some of these storylines are heading. Forgive the entanglements, but trust me, it is all part of the fun in uncovering what is happening in our intertwining tales of love and money. Section 3. Contemporary and Personal Relevance Love and our conception of ourselves heavily influence the prism with which we see life. Maybe not everyone is as focused on finding love, but there are plenty who do. In a world where marriages and relationships are unstable, there is a continual and perpetual search for love. Along with the increase of financial scams and online theft, the loneliness and isolation imposed by worldwide lockdowns led to a dramatic increase in the search of love online. I remember an old adage that when one visits a psychic, it will regard primarily three basic questions, love, health, and money. Depending on the age of the person inquiring, we tell you which of the two is likely the motive in seeking advice. The young, love and money. Middle age, love and health. Old age, health and money. The pandemic has seen a rise in scams, including consulting psychics. Love scams via online dating are on the rise too the latter becoming a fairly sizable concern as the zeros are adding up. In 2020, romance scams have gone up 50% from 2019 to the sizable amount of $304 million in the United States. In the United Kingdom, online shopping fraud amounted to 63 million pounds, while romance fraud amounted to 68 million pounds. Romance fraud also accounts for 20% of the bank transfer fraud in the United Kingdom. Romance fraud is becoming more prevalent as the rewards and profit margins are higher than any other form of financial scams. What is romance fraud? Using the lure of a relationship to scam a person out of money. While the focus is on the rising online methods via dating apps and social media, the method formerly referred as sweetheart scams have long been prevalent. But that's the talk of relatively anonymous paramours. What if the people were actually known to you in person? Those amounts might go even higher. Our tales involve the latter. Wicked tales of greed, lust, and envy made all the more delicious because they are true. Well, mostly true. Many lies have been told. Can you discern who is hiding what secret? In case you haven't caught them yet, my two webinars of the Waldorf Astoria Hotels are returning to the New York Adventure Club just in time for the 90th anniversary of the Waldorf Astoria, New York. Please come join me on Monday, September 27th for the original 1893 to 1929 hotel and Thursday, September 30th for the current 1931 to present at 530 Eastern and 230 Pacific. All webinars are $10 live with one week access afterwards. We will also get an updated peek at the ongoing renovations. 
For more information or registration, please check out www.nyadventureclub.com or the events section at asthemoneyburns.com. Next, when we return to As the Money Burns, it's off to the races when an international yacht competition brings challengers from all over the world. This year's winner will be the first of his kind. Until then. As the Money Burns is an original podcast written, produced, and voiced by Nikki Woodard based on historical research. Archival music has been provided by Past Perfect Vintage Music. Check out their website at www.pastperfect.com. Please come visit us at As the Money Burns via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Transcripts, timeline, episode guide, and character bios are available at asthemoneyburns.com.